Hey everyone, fascinating chat today with the CEO of Smartling, a guy who knows a thing or two about turning hype into real enterprise ROI. Brian, how are you? I'm doing great, Evan. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for being here. Before we dive in, perhaps introduce yourself and how would you describe Smartling these days? Sure. Uh, well, to start, my name is Brian Murphy. I'm the CEO of Smartling and we are an AI translation company. So our customers include companies like uh, Apple, IBM, OpenAI, um, Anthropic, Disney, Pepsi, you name it, lots of big global enterprises that use us to help create multilingual experiences that, they're, that, they're, that their customers love. Fantastic. So let's talk big picture. You've been around the block uh, a couple of times. You've seen the internet, the cloud, and now the AI revolution up close. What feels the same this time or or what's totally different in your opinion? Yeah, you know, it's it's funny. Um, this, uh, this feels a lot like uh, the late 90s, you know, with the commercialization of the internet. Um, back then, all the, infra uh, the initial investment was in infrastructure, right? Remember telecom, right? We had to do all that. Um, and then, um, and, and now uh, the investment is in, uh, is in infrastructure, right? So data centers, chips, and uh, building out the, the models, the AI, the, the AI models. And I think that um, these technology waves, I've been through at least three of them now, and they, they tend to follow a similar pattern. First, the infrastructure gets built out. And then, um, and then business applications, or, or I should say not business, app, but applications start um, getting built, right, to take advantage of that new infrastructure. So you can think of an example like Salesforce is a great example, right? So um, back in the, uh, as cloud was being built out, they didn't invent cloud, but they made, um, they made their application, they made it accessible and transformative for the business users. So I think that the same thing is happening right now. Foundational models are the new infrastructure but the real value is, is beginning to get created up the stack. Um, companies like Smartling that make AI useful, measurable, and ROI driven um, in real workflows with purpose built applications is the way I describe it. Yes. Well, if, if there is a killer app, you certainly have one. Um, so all the hype of, and excitement around infrastructure is great for geeks like me. Uh, I, I, I'm fascinated by it. But uh, do you see more and more of the value in AI shifting to the app layer and, and from the sort of model layer? I, yeah, I do. I do. I think, you know, um, once again, like if we go back to the commercialization of the Internet, I mean, when we were building out our first e-commerce companies, we had to build everything. I mean, there wasn't a Shopify, mm. right? We had to build our own payment systems. We had to build our own CRMs. We had to build our own PIM, you know, like catalogs, everything, right? Um, and then companies come along and they build those purpose-built applications to solve real, real business problems. And I think that's happening here. We see, um, you know, as the foundational models, um, they're, they're the pace of it, the pace of uh, improvement is, is slowing, right, on them. And companies now, you're beginning to see companies like, um, you know, like Harvey and Cursor and Smartling, mm -hmm. creating like these, 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 these applications that solve very sp um, specific problems. And so. Translation is probably one of the top five use cases of AI um, in uh, out, out there, right? There's, uh, we know that it's uh, AI is great at content generation. It's it's really having a big impact on generating code, and translation is definitely one of those things. And when we look at that impact, um, you know, our customers are able to translate. Uh, 3x more content for about 60 wow. percent yeah about 60 percent less cost and six times faster than traditional so that's the impact of AI on translation that is fantastic and you know what are traditional SaaS companies getting wrong about AI or or their what what about their approach would do you think they're they're not getting right um I think that Probably one of the one of the big challenges that traditional SaaS companies um, have, or one of the challenges that they have, is mindset. So mm. they tend to the, the thinking is typically to um, for a legacy SaaS company to bolt AI features onto old workflows, and that doesn't work real great. We've all kind of had that experience. the uh, The real opportunity is, um, and the requirement is, I think you have to rethink the entire experience. Um, what mm. data do you collect? 
how the users inter interact with the application, how output gets measured. And what that meant for us was really re-architecting SmartLink with our AI hub, uh, generating agentic workflows and mm -hmm. um, different ways of integrating to our customers' tech stack. So really completely transforming that experience. And I think that like this was painful. Like we had to redesign uh, our application in order to make it work in this new mode. It wasn't, it wasn't a bolt on, it was a reimagination of how it works. Fantastic. And there's, you know, lots of talk about the death of SAS uh, by AI or, or the models themselves, which seems pretty overstated, uh, of course. Um, but what, what are the risks to traditional SAS models, maybe to your model, not just from com competition, but from the models themselves? Yeah, I think there definitely is a risk. I mean, if you if you go back to cloud, right? You remember, um, uh, you know, I mean, there's companies like Siebel and Oracle, and and they're still and, and Oracle obviously is around very successful, but <laughs> that was an incredibly painful pro, uh, mm. process for them when that old model of selling software licenses, right, two million dollar deal, like was the way they thought of the world, right? Then all of a sudden, companies like Salesforce and HubSpot come along, and they're like, hey, you know what? We're going to charge you per seat per user per month, um, <laughs> and this cloud based, right? Not not on prem. Uh, sort of thing. And it was like a complete shift from doing business and the applications and all of that. And I think that the risk is for legacy SaaS companies that don't make that shift, that they will be supplanted by, um, by AI first, uh, I'll call them SaaS companies or application, maybe we'll call them yeah. application companies, right? So I don't think that, like, so for example, I do view like uh, GPT, we, I mean, GPT, Anthropic, um, you know, Cloud, all the Gemini, they're all, these are all partners of ours. They're, they're tremendous technology, but I do view them as infrastructure rather than applications. They're very yeah. good at doing like, kind of like anything and everything. Right. <laughs> but like in order to get really good, um, at, at doing something, you have to focus on it. Oh, really well said. And there's lots of talk in the media and elsewhere on um, AI successes, but also AI failures, lots of projects not succeeding, lots of trials, experimentation, science projects. You're well past the science project phase. You're in high volume production with who's who in the enterprise. Uh, how can enterprise teams make sure their pilots kind of deliver real ROI and not just, you know, headlines or splashy, you know, demos? Yeah, we're, we're well past that. We, in fact, it was interesting. Just uh, yesterday I was checking and um, nearly, nearly 80% of the translation that we deliver is now powered by AI, right? As of Q3, which is, um, pretty, pretty remarkable when you think about it. And we're probably one of the fastest growing translation companies in the $30 billion market. So, um, it's not, it's not insignificant. Um, I think I see, you know, we, you know, there's a famous MIT study that recently came out that said, uh, that, uh indicated that 95% of enterprise AI projects were, were failing, right? And I think that one of the problems or one of the reasons for that is that companies treat, tend to have a tendency to treat AI like a science project. You know, lots and lots of pilots, uh, you know, mm -hmm. 20 plus pilots, lots of excitement, but without a specific business outcome in mind. So I, I do think, and I, I also do think that, you know, Jack Welch famously said, you know, uh, to outsource, you know, everyone's got a, everyone's got a front office. It's always a good idea to back so outsource your back <laughs> office to someone's front office, right? And with with the AI being having the potential to do everything, and by the way, incredible pressure from investors, board of directors, on CEOs to produce results with AI. There's this incredible pressure within enterprises to use AI, right? Um, what I found is that, and, and so, and we're still early in the cycle, right? So there's not a, lo a lot of applications for them to do that. So they're being forced to sort of experiment. I think over the next 24 months, you're going to start seeing, and you are starting to see these, these really great AI applications coming out that are having huge impacts on their enterprise customers. And you're going to see this migration away from this sort of experimentation to, hey, you know what? Um, that's a great solution. Let's use that. I actually have a a funny example of I, I actually did this ourselves. I'm one of that. We're part of that 95%. I was um, frustrated with the fact that we didn't have AI 
uh, for our customer service, right? So someone could type into a chat box and chat box and get an answer. I'm like, we're an AI company. Let's do this. So we, um, we actually, I directed my engineering team to build that solution. And uh, 90 days later, we were struggling getting the, uh, the results we wanted to. And we um, went out to uh, a, a customer and partner of ours called Intercom. And they have this um, AI application called Finn for customer service. And it worked great. Plugged it right in, did everything we wanted to do. But that's like sort of my point. Like I was being forced as a CEO to, 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 to start experimenting and building this stuff internally because there, there wasn't this available solution. Now these available solutions are starting to pop up. And I think you're going to see enterprises gravitating to, to those purpose-built applications and really get tremendous results. Great point. And there's some indication that model innovation is slowing down or at least, you know, going through a bit of a, trough, uh, uh, given the existing technologies, um, and we've seen this explosion of innovation, but where should B2B software companies focus their energy next as we, you know, consume all these models and get to understand how they work? Yeah, you know, the models are still improving, albeit at a slower pace, right? So mm -hmm. the, the first iterations, like, were big step changes, and now you're getting into a little bit more of this granularity in terms of improvement, and um, they're, you know, they're, 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 they're yeah, they're just not improving as quickly as they were before. And so I would stop chasing models, right? Which one's mm. going to be better and start focusing on building orchestration, right? So uh, as foundation models become more like the cloud, powerful, but largely invisible, the real differentiation is how you connect them to solve your customer's problem, your data and your workflow. So every serious SaaS company should be focusing on building its own AI orchestration layer um, we do that with, we, we do that, our, ours is called AI hub, and we use that mm. to route data, select the best model, learn continuously from customer feedback. And wow. I think that, I think that companies that, uh, that will win this decade, uh, will be the ones that make AI usable for their customers. Fantastic. And you have quite a balancing act. It seems it's smartling AI innovation on one hand with customer trust. That must be huge, hugely important and translation quality. How do you think about juggling all those balls when things are moving so fast? Well, it's, it's critical. Um, you know, when you think about what SmartLink does, we're, we're helping them transform their content uh, into global experiences, right? And that's all about brand. And so you can't have missteps, right? Um, you know, you're creating source content, uh, translating into 15 different languages. You need to know what you just said. You don't have room for hallucination. Right, uh, mm -hmm. a mistranslation has created many, many of a brand headache or a customer uh, relationship headache for CEOs around the world. So we take that very seriously. So a big part of what we do is we uh, obviously integrating to the existing tech stack for automation. We automate 99% of our customers' translation. We wow. then um, we then build custom trained models uh, for translation for each of the companies. So it matches. It, so it contains their translation memory glossary, style guide, uh, brand voice, right? So if I'm uh, any one of these company, any one of our customers translating to a multitude of different languages, it's gonna carry that brand voice in any of those countries and match the tone and style of voice that's required, right? So that's, that's a big part of what we do. But then very importantly, what we do is on the back end of that, the governance. Um, so we've got significant governments, governance uh, policies in place, um, we have hallucination detection and mitigation. Hmm. Um, we have automated language quality assurance, so that wow. our customer. Yeah, this is all important. So, when, you know, we have we, we translate seven billion words a year for our customers. Oh my they, gosh. Wow. Right. So, um, at, at extremely high scale and in an automated way, uh, we need to be able. Our customers need to be able to rely on us that that content is coming out on brand and with very, very high quality. Fantastic. Well, this isn't a tech uh, deep dive, but I would be curious, maybe you can give us a peek into the future, your roadmap, where things are headed. I can imagine with translation, there's things like real-time audio, real-time video translation, and so many use cases, so many applications. W what is, how will this evolve over the next one, two, five years? Yeah, I think right now, if you look at where we are, we're right now, our customers, as a result of using SmartLink AI translation, are able to translate 3x more content for 60% less cost 
six times faster than traditional, right? That's a massive impact right there. Where we see that going over the next 24 months is, uh, like, as you indicated, multi-modality, as we call it, right? right? So that's uh, video, audio, et cetera, added into the, the traditional use cases. Um, and really think about translation as a service, right? So that's sort of like our, our end game where um, users within the enterprise that need to have multilingual content, they're able to create that multilingual content uh, seamlessly within their platforms and uh, be, be assured of being able to produce on-brand, high-quality, uh, translated, localized content. Yeah, that's fantastic. I, I did play with an app that translates, you know, your voice, uh, a consumer app in, you know, eight different languages, including your lip syncing and your, you know, tonality, your, your, your tone of voice. And it was pretty shocking to see. I shared yeah. it with friends, one with Hindi, one with French, and they said, yeah, it's you. It's, it's me. It's in my voice. I just can't imagine the possibilities. And speaking of possibilities, you know, there's so many startup founders getting into this space, not just your space, but AI. Uh, what's your advice to them with starting, you know, if they want to build an AI app layer company, what's your, what are your words of wisdom uh, and uh, guidance? I think number one is identify a problem that you can fix like by 10x, right? It's got to right. be. Uh, like incremental is really tough to do. Uh, you want to really have a huge impact. And then when you build that product, make sure that you've got enough TAM, uh, total addressable market. A lot of time, uh, uh, you know, sometimes people are, I always say, are you, are you developing uh, a feature or a product, right? That's one thing. And then B is the, um, is the total addressable market large enough? In other words, are willing, people willing to, are, enough people willing to pay enough money for it that you can create a $200 million business. Well, great advice and congratulations on all the success onwards and upwards. So much more work to be done. Thanks, Brian. It was my pleasure. It was great talking with you, Evan. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And thanks everyone for listening, watching, checking out our TV show, techimpact.tv, now on Bloomberg and Fox Business. Thanks, Brian. Thanks everyone.